The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. This is Alan Brody, your host for the Organization of Legal Professionals, Paralegal Knowledge Institute, and I'm bringing you Tech Talk Tuesday, audio search and speed, audio search with speed and precision. Today we have uh, Johannes Scholtes speaking for us. I'll introduce him in just a moment. Uh, Johannes is the Chairman and Chief Strategy Officer at Xilab. His leadership is, and vision has shaped Xilab into an information, an e-discovery and information governance powerhouse across, across the globe. Johannes holds a Master of Science degree in Computer Science and a PhD in Computational Linguistics, as well as a full professorship in text mining at the University of Maastricht. He was a member of the Board of Directors of the Association of, the, of Information and Image Management from 2010 to 2012. So we uh, welcome him to our airwaves. We want to uh, advise you to put your questions in, in the chat at any time, and we'll be taking them at the end of the presentation. So, uh, with uh, no further ado, uh, I'm going to give you uh, uh, John Johannes, and um, let's have a great webinar. Okay, thank you, Alan. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm very happy uh, to be able to speak for uh, more than an hour about uh, one of my favorite topics, uh, audio search. Um, and um, and I would uh, I'm going to uh, show you um, a number of slides. Uh, making you uh, familiar with the topic and at the end of this uh, this uh, uh, tech talk uh, you should be a uh, uh, really understand the technology how you can use it uh, and um, and you will be uh, well trained to uh, and equipped to uh, to start uh, using this type of technology audio search is uh, is becoming more and more important uh, in e-discovery uh, I would also like you to uh, refer to you to the, uh, the blo recent blog from Mary Mack. Uh, you can see the link there, uh, where she discusses the, the legal context uh, of uh, audio search and uh, why it's important. And she also refers to a number of cases where uh, spoliation of uh, audio evidence uh, has been uh, a major topic. Okay, today's agenda. We have uh, seven points. Uh, first, I'll uh, give you a short introduction. Uh, I promise it will be very short to Xilab. Uh, then I'll uh, uh, discuss a little bit how we see that the e-discovery world is changing, uh, not only in the U.S. but worldwide. Uh, we'll uh, discuss the need for audio search in the context of e-discovery, but also in the context of governance, uh, enterprise information archiving, and, uh, and uh, law enforcement regulatory agency uh, investigations. And then we dive a little bit deeper into the, uh, the technology. Uh, how does Xilab uh, implement audio search and why do we think it's, uh, it's the best way to use this technology for the specific type of applications that we're going to discuss today. Uh, I'll show you the, the details. Uh, we'll uh, discuss the benefits and conclusions and then after that there's time for questions. Okay, so Xilab very quickly founded in 1983. Founded in uh, Chicago, Illinois, actually Buffalo Grove. Uh, offices worldwide now with uh, more than 100 uh, employees, dual headquarters in the US and Europe. Uh, we were the first one with uh, full text search on the PC back in 1983, and since then we've been uh, many, uh, we've been into the introduction of many different uh, innovations in the field of e discovery, investigations, and intelligent information governance. Uh, we're very strong in supporting uh, languages other than English. Um, and we have more than uh, 9,000 installations worldwide with an astonishing number of uh, 1.7 million users. Now, we help our clients basically with three basic topics. First, we help them to deal with the information overload. We help them to increase productivity, do more with less. And all of these things we do it in a defensible, uh, legally acceptable, best practice, uh, best uh, method case templates, case law references. Um, and this is very important in the legal and investigative uh, type of applications, that whatever you do is defensible. It has to be able to stand up in court. And um, we do this by offering an integrated platform, and that can be linked to almost any internal or cloud-based IT product out there. 
Uh, and uh, that includes a lot of different types of technology, not only search technology, discovery technology, legal review workflow, processing, etc. Uh, but also audio search, uh, image search, and a lot of other advanced technology. Now what we see happening, why is this relevant? Uh, is that the e-discovery world is changing. And in the early days of e-discovery, going back to 2005, 2006, most companies just outsourced almost every sizable project to vendors, law firms, uh, and e-discovery uh, was barely a, a blip on the radar of technology analysts. Um, this is what Gardner states. Fast forwarding to uh, just a few years ago, what we see now is an explosive information growth and it's just organizations can no longer afford to turn their data to other parties because the, the bills are just getting uh, astronomical. And uh, what we see is that today less and less of the uh, work is being outsourced uh, to the traditional e-discovery service industry and more and more organizations are doing the identification collection processing of the whole e-discovery data in-house and we see also more and more organizations uh, going a little bit more further to the right side of the EDRM, also hosting their own uh, legal review or uh, and this can be either on premise or in a SaaS environment where they control the data and then they allow third parties, law firms and service providers to log into their platform, um, do their work, uh, whatever they can do, they can do it themselves in-house and it's a great tool for them to, uh, to uh, measure productivity and also to uh, keep control of uh, the cost and the risk of this whole e-discovery process. Now, this technology that we're going to discuss today, audio search, which until recently was only available uh, uh, to like service bureaus and technology specialists, and it was very expensive. What we've seen recently is that prices have come down, and uh, and we have uh, integrated this technology into our platform, making it also available for in-house use. Now, e-discovery. Let's uh, take a look at uh, where and what we uh, define as e-discovery. Now, e-discovery and also uh, the related field of, of uh, file analysis really is business dealing with incidents. It's, it's, it's an integrated part of many different business processes. Uh, of course, there's all the federal rules, civil procedure, criminal and civil lawsuits, but there's also the regulatory inquiries. Especially in Europe, this is a major reason for uh, for uh, the need for e-discovery technology. Uh, HR, harassment, wrongful termination, uh, management of employee files, uh, internal security issues, intellectual property theft, uh, data protection, privacy becoming more and more a relevant issue. Um, investigations into fraud, bribery, procedural non-compliance by auditors. Um, the whole area of the Freedom of Information Act and public records is, is very similar to that of e-discovery and uh, especially for local, state and federal government this is a major uh, problem where the process and, and risks are very similar to that of e-discovery and audio is also very relevant and, and when I'm talking about audio I'm not just talking about audio recordings but also about the audio component of, uh, of video uh, so you see it's actually a pretty broad area and then in the government there's a couple of additional uh, applications where we see that this technology is used uh, a lot uh, very clearly, of course, is, is in investigations, law enforcement, regulatory investigations, uh, audio is becoming more and more part of the, uh, the uh, search for evidence, um, and attorney general's offices, regulators, and, and police uh, love this technology. On the other hand, there is also congressional, or as we call it in Europe and in Australia, parliamentary inquiries done by the uh, Office of the Inspector General or other uh, in-house or, or uh, government bodies that uh, investigate spending of money. Now, to all of this, this is all e-discovery, uh, and and this all includes not only text; it also includes audio and video. And uh, this is a great uh, quote here: "This call may be recorded for quality insurance." And uh, what they don't say is it can and will be used against you in any type of investigation. And it's also subject of uh, e-discovery in the case of any type of incident or issue. Because what we see these days, organizations keep audio uh, all over the place. I think for myself today, uh, I've already been involved in some business calls and several of those I know for sure by, you know, the, the, by the people that I've been dealing with, they've been recording these days. But it's also in training, radio, analyst calls, uh, surveillance, monitoring systems, everybody uh, monitors uh, audio. And 
what we see is that uh, there's also many cases where regulatory agencies uh, require that uh, recordings uh, are, are, are safe, especially in the financial services industry. And the result is that there is a potential tsunami of electronically stored information, also called ESI. Now, industry analysts estimate that the processing, the cost of processing this, this legacy audio uh, may be 80% higher than the cost of process email. We all know what a problem email uh, has been to us in the past. Uh, there's all these growing mandates and scrutiny from uh, different regulations in Europe, uh, in, in the United States. And what we see is that the federal civil procedure and also the judicial opinions about uh, ESI are all media neutral. They don't care whether it's text, email, audio, uh, cloud-based, uh, social media, whatever. You know, it's all included. And we can confidently say that audio ESI really is a time bomb waiting to either go off or to be diffused, and it's up to you which one you want to select. Here's a couple of uh, cases uh, that I want to name, and I want to focus for, uh, there's a simple case in the first uh, example, but I want to focus on the second one, the Enron uh, case. Uh, in the Enron case, uh, we at Zilep assisted the FBI in Houston uh, with these investigations, and unfortunately, back in uh, 2002, we didn't have this technology, uh, because uh, what happened is that uh, the Enron case contained a number of audio recordings, about 2,800 audio hours, and it required uh, the FBI to work for t two to three months, seven days a week, to transcribe and listen to these audio recordings and convert them uh, into text. And they produced 10 hours of audio, a very small fraction uh, of this 2,800 uh, hours with about 82 audio exhibits, and um, it was very impractical, very uh, expensive, um, and, and you can imagine that, that in many other cases uh, people don't even start, or if, you, if, if parties consider it's relevant, uh, you look like, uh, you know, uh, very expensive people uh, charging you two, three hundred dollars an hour listening to audio, and um, that's going to be expensive. Now, how about information governance? Uh, what we see is that more and more organizations are interested uh, in intelligent information governance solutions. They're no longer going to wait uh, for an incident to happen because they know that these incidents happen. And um, what they want to do is they want to lower litigation. They want to lower regulatory and e-discovery risks by significantly reducing data volumes and also organizing unstructured information. And audio is definitely part of that data. Uh, and what we see is that really competitive organizations uh, do not only look at what's in their text files and emails and, and, and file shares, but they also look at, okay, what, what, is there any audio? Is there any risk there? Uh, and it allows them to stay focused on running their business. They're on top of their incidents. If they are, they can focus on growing the top line, increase customer experience, which is very important for uh, audio search, because if your customers are not happy, they're going to tell, they're going to tell this to your salespeople or support people uh, in the service calls that, uh, that they have. And why would you not use all this information? You know, and as a result, you can release new products faster. You can, you can protect your reputation. And typically in the past, and uh, this, this is like, I think about five years ago, <clears throat> the only practical solution was to just listen, human listening. Um, and, and, and this is a problem because a human, you know, a person can only listen to one call at a time. Uh, people have a limited attention span, uh, failable memory, uh, and what we see is that uh, even the most skilled analysts are not able to to listen 24/7 to uh, to data, uh, of course. And, and even if they do only work eight hours a day, you see that they 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 take different decisions at different moments in time. And Monday morning they do something very different from Friday afternoon, and this is a problem. So, next to this uh, this approach, uh, the traditional approach has been to convert speech to text, because we all have this search technology for text. So the initial idea was to convert the speech to text, and then we search in the text. Transcripts were produced, um, and, and, and again, this can only be done in real time. Uh, there has been different types of solutions, also technology solutions, that created an automatic transcript, and I think we all know how frustrating has been, it has been in the past that the quality of this technology was never good enough. And one of the reasons is that the speech-to-text technology depends on a dictionary. And only in applications where there is a limited 
uh, vocabulary, limited dictionary in a medical domain or a help desk domain or, or like a service desk domain for, for insurance companies or, or these type of typical call centers. Um, it, it has been very, very hard to use speech to text reliably. Most of the time uh, it also required a very high recording quality like a 64 kilobit uh, kilohertz um, of the recording and uh, what you see if somebody was calling out of his car with his window open with a mobile phone with a one kilohertz uh, uh, recording um, the quality was was disastrous and it wouldn't work and there's also another problem is that if the names most of the time for 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 like e-discovery investigative type of person of applications people are looking for names location names, individual names, uh, organization names. And if these names are not in a dictionary, and it's almost impossible to get every name that's out there in the world uh, into a dictionary, it won't recognize it. Typically, these, 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 these uh, speech-to-text technology requires a two-step approach, where the first step, it, it, there is something which, like the phonemes, we'll get back to that, are being recognized. And the second step, the phonemes are converted into, uh, into text. And uh, both of these processes result in an error, typically around 20%. And uh, so you can add 20% to 20%. And, uh, and, and that's what we see is that typically these uh, speech-to-text in the general domain uh, are uh, not recognizing more than 60% uh, of the words. A lot of the interesting names are being recognized as highly frequent pronouns and nouns and verbs and as a result it's not very useful uh, for analysts. Now, what, what do we do at Xylet? We don't generate a transcript. So don't call us and uh, tell you I have a lot of data, I want to have transcripts. We don't do that. Uh, what we do is we make the audio searchable by focusing on the first step, by recognizing the phonemes. We do this very fast. Uh, and then, when we search for certain words, we convert the words into phonemes as well, and we do a fuzzy match. And that's, that gives a, a great uh, recognition rate, and it's great for searching uh, and finding relevant data. And then, of course, we don't have text, so if you want to submit it to court, uh, you have to transcribe. But in tr instead of transcribing everything, uh, we just transcribe what's relevant, and that saves you a lot of time and a lot of uh, problems. A phonetic search is really unique. It, it, we, we can ingest audio at a speed of 80 times um, the speed of human, uh, human listening and human speaking. So it's 80 times faster. Uh, it works on locals hardware. Uh, you can run it on your PC. Uh, it's, it's all multi-threading. Uh, so you can also uh, use parallel hardware and scale it up horizontally. Um, searching is extremely fast. It's almost directly. It's uh, it's uh, way way faster than uh, than searching or listening out to all the data, and it doesn't depend on the dictionary. Uh, you can search uh, any word, uh, any type of uh, uh, word, and, and a great example is actually here in this slide that uh, we showed from the FBI, the Enron versus the Snohomish. How Snohomish? You can imagine it's in no dictionary. And without this type of phonetic search, you cannot find it. But with our search, what we did is we, we, we have a demo of this where we made the Enron files, the original Enron files, with very, very low quality uh, searchable. You can see that even on this word like Snohomish, uh, uh, regardless of how it's being pronounced by people, we can actually uh, actually find the files uh, that contain this word. So why is it better? Well, it's very simple. U.S. English has about, uh, sorry, that's typo, 40 phonemes, and, and U.K. English has about 44 phonemes. And instead of having to recognize like an infinite number of names uh, and, and, and locations and individual names and, and huge vocabularies consisting of hundreds of thousands of words, we can focus on just recognizing the, these 40 or 44 phonemes. And then we search in these phonemes, and the cost of ownership of this approach is really a fraction of the speech-to-text uh, approach, let alone the 100% manual effort to process uh, audio data. So what we do is we, we take this audio data, we, uh, we, we, we index it, uh, very similar to full-text indexing uh, in text. Uh, instead of um, using the words and the characters, we use uh, the phonemes, and then we also create a kind of probabilistic model. Uh, we store all this, and when we search for a word, uh, depending on the language, we, uh, we, we, we look up in the dictionary or we key it in phonetically uh, how this word would have been pronounced. And then we do a fuzzy match and that gives us the search results. 
works great. Um, very, very, very useful for e-discovery, uh, compliance, uh, categorization problems, workflow, routing uh, of documents, uh, investigations, uh, identifying fraudulent uh, activities, competitive intelligence, etc. Now, there's a couple of things that are a little bit different uh, to uh, searching in phonemes and phonetic search uh, than in uh, traditional text. First of all, when we index data, we extract these 40 or 44 uh, phonemes, and, and some languages have more phonemes than others, uh, for fast search. Uh, what we do is, uh, what you have to make sure is that the audio quality and the encoding, whether it's a WAV file or an MP3 file, MP3 file can make a difference. And um, you also have to be careful that if you're converting audio recordings, every conversion could degrade the audio further. Um, so we've seen cases where there was a particular recording in a particular quality and it was then converted to uh, another file format or another quality and the recognition rate was actually, uh, actually lower. So you have to be careful because the perceived audio quality that we humans have is not necessarily the best one uh, to mine. So the more you pre-process, uh, the more it can degrade. Uh, also we see that one of the big problems is, is, is multi-channel. Uh, or, or crossover where people uh, interfere with each other or where there's music in the background uh, or where there's a lot of noise in the background and uh, that makes the quality uh, uh, harder to recognize and in general what we see is that client type of recording so a handset recording is of course much less quality than a recording in the, uh, at the switchboard level so these are things that you have to take into consideration now, when we uh, generate these searches, it's language dependent, so uh, uh, you have to uh, uh, know what the language is. And also, <clears throat> we cannot search for numbers. Uh, you know, numbers can be pronounced in different ways. You know, 100 is easy, but uh, how about 2,800? Is it 28 on 100 or 2,800? So, when you're searching for numbers, you have to key them in in different ways that you think that people can pronounce them. Uh, percent has to be put in like percent. 1.2 million uh, has to be inputted 1.2 million dollars or uh, 1 uh, comma 2 if you're in different countries. So, so this is important to understand um, and um, what we see is that, that there's, there's, there's these, these, these estimates that you need to make uh, in order to get uh, the, the best uh, matching. Now, like I said, we have uh, 44 phonemes for UK English, 44 uh, US English, about uh, around 50 for Dutch and then and, and Arabic has a couple of other phonemes. Now these phonemes are, are not unique, they're for different languages, they're different and you have to take it into consideration. So if you have English speaking people, uh, you have to kind of, uh, you have to put it in in different ways. You either have to put in the different types of uh, pronunciations um, and of course uh, we all know the different types of pronunciations that there are between UK English and American English and even within uh, American English, uh, there are uh, different types of uh, phonations. So, you have to take this into consideration. And another thing is that phonetic search ignores word boundaries. It's one large probabilistic stream of phonemes. So, speech recognition, as I put here, speech recognition is all run together and not nicely cut up into words. Uh, it has a great advantage because uh, if words are like interconnected, we'll recognize them. And one of the hardest problems in speech recognition is the flow from one word to the other. Now, if you would record TV or broadcasting, these are professional presenters. And you will notice that they always take very clear breaks between words. So speech recognition technology works very well on, on, on audio recordings from TV, uh, radio, uh, professional interviewers, especially if they're recorded in 64 kilohertz. Uh, but if you have like an individual that's not a professional speaker, you, you'll see that there are all kinds of issues. Uh, there's the noise, there's the words that are merged together, they use dialect, uh, they don't pronounce it properly, and uh, that's a big problem. Now, we can still search in data that's uh, generated by those type of individuals. Now, if you want to search, uh, you have to find, you know, reasonable, you have to use good search phrases. So if you search for cat, you know, you get not only cat, you also get scat, you get category, and of course, this is a stupid query. It's the same like searching on Google for single words. You get millions of irrelevant hits. 
Um, longer words and longer word sequences uh, maximize the use of the acoustic information and shouldn't use words like ant and it uh, unless you connect them. Here's an example. If you search for, for analytics, which we consider poor search term, you get like five million, 572 million results. Now, if you add speech analytics to it, you get 12 million, so it's a little better. Uh, you should add Xilab speech analytics, you only have 1,600. So, so this is the way how you should uh, define what you're looking uh, for. And uh, typically what we see is that really good phrases have like more than 10 phonemes. And then you have the perfect like precision and recall. Shorter words, you may find what you're looking for, but you can also find more, uh, more noise. Uh, for instance, uh, bad is happy, poor is happiness, and pursuit of happiness, if that's what you're looking for, uh, that's a really good query. So try to combine verbs and nouns uh, in such a way that you get the ideal uh, search queries. Not for other one, govern, uh, not very good government either, but systems of government, that's, uh, that's a really good phrase. Now, when you're doing search, you have to, uh, and, and I'm sure that all the search experts listening are familiar to this, there's, uh, there's correct recognition, uh, there's correct rejection, uh, which we call the true positives and the true negatives. But then there's two things which cause problems. One of them is the false positives, which uh, where the computer system thinks it recognizes a name or a word where it's actually another word, or the false negatives, uh, where it doesn't recognize one. Now, depending on your application, the false positive or the false negative can be a big problem. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit uh, later. Now, What's accuracy? Accuracy means a different thing to different people for different application. And uh, precision is like the percentage of the results that are correct. So if you have 10 results and 8 are good, you have 80% precision. And it measures how many false positives you have. Recall is the measure what's out there in the database, what's out there in the field, and how many of those relevant words do I find. And um, what we see is that uh, with recall, if you, for instance, if there's a hundred relevant words out there uh, and you find only 80, then your recall is 80. Now, the big problem with recall is that you don't know what's what's there. So, the only way to measure recall is to create a ground truth, truth uh, that's then uh, compared to uh, to what you're searching. Uh, we've been doing a lot of these tests, uh, different languages, different type of applications, and we found that this technology was way better than any other type of technology. Uh, that, uh, that that's out there. Now, when you do these relevancy scores, you have to uh, also take into consideration that, that with text matching, unless you're using fuzzy search in the Xilab uh, engine, it, it's more or less a binary process, so word is present or not, and you can use fuzzy search and wildcards to pick up some different uh, type of words, but phoneme matching is much more probabilistic, so there's more noise, there's more non-deterministic uh, type of uh, type of behavior, so you can easily get audio that's not 100% correctly what you're looking for, and this is something uh, we 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 train our users for. We we set the expectations that they know that this is actually happening, and 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 uh, there's great benefits to this technology, but you should not you should not uh, expect it to be 100% correct, which is also not the intention because. Using it, you know, the alternative for this type of technology is to listen everything out, which is undoable, a way too expensive. So anything we can do to help ourselves will work. Now what we can set is we, we can set a threshold. So we can indicate when we search, okay, do I want 60% uh, accuracy, 40% uh, or 80%? And the higher you set a threshold, the less uh, false positives you get, but the higher the risk that there's false negatives, that you're not finding everything. So depending on your uh, uh, application, uh, you can set your thresholds lower, you get more hits, you get more correct hits, uh, but you also get more false positives. Now the way how we've handled this is that in our interface we allow users to jump directly to the segment of the audio where we think the word is. So it's like jumping from hit to hit to hit. So our users can very quickly determine whether it's a, uh, an accurate hit or not an accurate hit. And uh, so typically, depending on the quality and then the words you're looking for and how well you are able to define a, a proper search query you know, between 10 or 15 uh, phonemes, you can play with the threshold and see, okay, this is generating, you know, this is kind of giving me what I'm expecting. 
and this is the, the kind of noise that I'm getting, and this is uh, acceptable. Uh, you can plot that in a graph, the false negatives against the false positives, and the more, the higher you set the, uh, the threshold, uh, the, 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 the less false uh, positives you get, but you also get less, uh, you also get, you know, lower hits, so there's a larger risk for, for false negatives and, and vice versa. So, so these two operators are reversely proportional, one goes up, the other go down. And, um, and that's important. So accuracy can be tuned by the user, but it's also uh, important that these users understand uh, what they're doing and that they also take the business benefit into consideration. Because um, uh, depending on what you're doing, depending on whether you're a law enforcement officer or uh, uh, you have another type of application, you need probably either more recall or you need more precision. Now, performance speed, let's take a look at this. What you can you expect? Uh, typically on a two-core uh, dual processor, we, we can index at 80 times real time. This means that uh, 80 hours is indexed in one hour. Um, uh, so one hour is about 45 uh, seconds. Uh, we can search at about 30,000 times the real time uh, speed per search term, depending on the length. So it's, it's really way, way faster than listing it out. And even, even if you get like, you know, 100 false hits, it will take you much less times, time than if you uh, listen everything out manually. So typically, first interaction, it's a little slower. It indexes and search. Second interaction, it search. Now, what affects uh, the search results? Most important, quality of the audio. Uh, how is it captured? What's the codec? What's the quality? What's the frequency of the kilohertz? Um, what's the nature of the application? What's the length? What's the discriminative power? What's the combinations of the words that you can look for? And what's the quality of your searches? Uh, can you define search terms? Uh, what's your application type? And uh, yeah, this, is, this, is, this is very important. What's very important for the performance is the audio quality. Uh, like I said, is it mono or stereo? Is there talk over? Is there crossover? Is there background noise? Is there music? Uh, is there consistent volume levels? Is there no static noise? Um, and how good can you define like more than ten uh, phonemes to do your uh, to do your search? And <coughs> yeah, there's there's a couple of issues you can have. Every time you convert audio, you lose uh, discriminatory information. So our experience is, is that it's really important uh, not to convert it, uh, you know, to, to get the data as close as you can to the moment of capture. Uh, age inside uh, audio, like a handset uh, or a microphone, is really much lower in quality than the, uh, than the, the one uh, recordings at the switchboard. Uh, so, um, and also headsets are very good. Uh, try to avoid background noise. And uh, if there is crossover, like in an interview or a telephone, try to record two channels and then use uh, phonetic recognition on each of the different channels. And that's really eliminating the problem of crossover. And if you have a conference call with different participants, make sure that you you uh, you record all of the uh, all of them as an individual channel. Uh, otherwise, you get uh, you get lower quality. Now, what we see is that this graph we just uh, displayed here with false negative against false positives. The better quality is closer to, closer to the axis, and the worse quality is more away from the axis. So, with good quality, you can have like a pretty large area for your threshold where you have an acceptable um, uh, recall and precision. Typically, this is around uh, 80%. If you have low quality, lots of crossovers and all kind of other issues, uh, you move away from this axis depending on how low the quality is. Now. Again, we have to focus on the uh, on the on the business uh, benefits. Uh, law enforcement, investigation, regulatory agencies. Typically, we see that they're focused on high recall. They want to see all the potential relevant hits. They don't care if they have to review them, but they're most afraid they're missing something. Uh, consumer applications. Uh, consumers have very little tolerance for errors. Uh, consumers want to have high precision. They don't care if they have like you know. Uh, not all the information, because a lot of the information will be duplicates. And there's no need for them to review every individual component, as long as they get an answer to their question as good as possible. So consumers like precision, law enforcement uh, like recall. Uh, very similar to what we see in search engines. Get the best quality audio result that's available. Focus on applications that are best suited for phonetic search. 
So you know, again, we don't generate the transcript. This is a search application. This is an application where if you have like a thousand hours, we will find you know the ten hours with relevant data. That's what you transcribe. What do you win? You don't have to transcribe nine hundred ninety hours. So it's a uh, it's a big uh, it's a big benefit. The perceived accuracy is very important. Numbers can be very deceptive. Um, you know, you can have like different calls, search twenty recorded calls for two different applications. If you want to check if if there if if your call center and police are keeping are sticking to the script, uh, if you find, for instance, twelve correct hits and four false positives, you have a precision which is twelve divided by sixteen, uh, which is seventy five percent. But for forensic. Suppose that I have one correct correct hit and and or investigative type of search, and I have four false positives. My precision is only twenty percent, but the forensic people won't won't bother because their recall was eighty percent, and the recall is probably what they are uh, interested in, and uh, that's what you want to want to get. So effective searches. How do you create an effective search? Well, it's really a process. You identify the topics of focus. You find relevant examples of recordings. You identify the key phrases, you adjust your threshold levels, evaluate against your objective, and release your searches. And, uh, and if you approach it in a structured way, you get really, really uh, good results. So clear business objectives are very important. Uh, phonetic speech is probabilistic, so success is measured by recall and precision. Uh, you can minimize the false positives and the false negatives. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you have to tune your relevance thresholds according to your application. Is it adherence, compliance, categorization, discovery, or consumer applications? And by using concepts, uh, using hierarchical uh, nested queries, uh, you make it easier for the users uh, to search and to find uh, the relevant information. And what you see here is how it looks in our software. It doesn't matter whether you search audio or text. Uh, it, it's 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 the same in our software. So you can say, okay, I want to search all documents for audio. Then we'll generate the phonemes and do our phoneme search. Or if you search for text uh, with or without fuzzy, then we do use our text search. So it's different indexes. So our system will automatically recognize audio, set it apart, and then make it searchable by using phonetic search. What you see here is it's fully embedded in the EDRM e-discovery process. We can tag it with all the new, normal text. We responsive, not responsive. Confidential, and you can see that here. Actually, this is a two-minute recording, and you see these red bars here, which are the hits. So you can move immediately to these hits and listen them out. Is it relevant? Tag them. It's not relevant. You don't tag them. And then, of course, there's all the meta information you can also use for searching. So it's it's very intuitive and very transparent uh, to uh, to the users. Languages um, for all those uh, North Americans. Um, what do we support? Well, we support a number of languages, uh, U.S. English, U.K. English, Spanish, of course, uh, French, Dutch, Brazilian, Russian, uh, different types of Arabic, Egyptian, Gulf, Canadian, French, German, and uh, more languages are on the way. Now, what is uh, important is um, we, we have clients with terabytes of audio. They want to search it as soon as possible. So it is important that you can scale up your performance by adding more hardware. Uh, now, the great thing about the Xilab architecture is that it's 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 fully running on a virtual machine architecture, hardware separated from the software, and it uses distributed computing, auto load balancing, and also horizontal scaling, and this allows us to infinitely scale up uh, the ability to uh, to do searching, to do indexing, phonetic recognition. Uh, search, uh, indexing files, deduplication, tiffing, uh, OCRing, whatever you need to do to make everything searchable. Um, so this is uh, very important. Now in summary, uh, the key benefits, uh, the, the, the technology that we use allows you to reduce the elapsed time between you know the moment you capture your audio devices and you know being able to find the relevant ones. Uh, you can search them for key phrases, uh, you don't have to listen them all out. Uh, works on standard hardware, and it's it's very rich, fully embedded uh, application. Now it's part of our platform, where we do much more, uh, where we can work also with email, SharePoint, network folders, all kinds of electronic file formats, email, uh, digitized paper, um, and of course for audio, the voicemail and instant messaging. Especially the voicemail is very interesting because a lot of phone systems these days are computer servers, 
and 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 we can actually collect directly uh, individual voicemail boxes, which are often not anything different than a directory on a file share. Uh, same with uh, video. I can get data from the cloud and we use it for a variety of applications. E-discovery, regulatory response, information archiving, uh, compliance monitoring, FOIA applications, public records, investigations, and also big data cleaning, structuring, consolidating of data centers. And all of this in an open platform, uh, modular, single instance storage, if that's what you want, virtual, privacy protected, auto redact, deep search, etc., etc. So our clients, just to name a few, uh, executive of the president, uh, two presidencies have been using our technology for e-discovery, uh, but also for secure uh, enterprise information archiving. And the great thing, the Xilab archiving format, I cannot stress this enough for the government's uh, listeners, is approved and accepted by the National Archives. Uh, this means that data in our format, if it needs to be kept for a longer period than just you know three, four, five years, uh, it can be archived in a file format that does not need to be converted anymore. And that's a great benefit. And if you're interested in that and you want to know how you can save all these expensive conversions, uh, which typically are necessary uh, with many of the proprietary archiving systems, then uh, please contact us and we'll tell you why our approach is different. Uh, the UN war crimes tribunals, uh, Rwanda, Yugoslavia, Cambodia, have all been using Sierra Leone, have all been using the Zyla technology um, and, uh, and, uh, and are still using it. Uh, the same for the International Court of Justice. And these folks, believe me, have a lot of data, a lot of paper, but also a lot of audio and video. Like I said, worldwide, 1.7 million users. 60 countries, 9,000 installations rely uh, on Xylos technology on the day-to-day. -day. So do we need audio search? Well, I think so. I hope I've convinced you today that, yes, we do need audio search. We cannot ignore the fact that there's this time bomb uh, that, we, uh, that we need to uh, take care of. And uh, why is uh, Xylos audio search as good as it is? Because it's great for search and investigation. Uh, phonetic search gives much better recall uh, and much faster than, uh, than transcription approaches. Index speed, we've seen it up to 660 times with ingestion and search up to more than 350,000 times depending on the hardware. But these, this is you know, how far we can go uh, because it's so scalable. And, and these are real numbers from real clients. And it's fully integrated in Xylab's defensible e-discovery platform. Uh, allowing you also to use it for investigations, compliance, and enterprise information archiving. Now, if you do uh, uh, want to listen to this again, uh, the webinar will be uh, available for download. Um, you can call us and uh, we'll tell you more about our solution. And there's also a couple of tips uh, from Aramec uh, that uh, show you how audio evidence can be handled better uh, and what you need to do to don't make the errors that uh, others have made uh, before you. So thank you very much uh, for your question. And if there are any questions, I would be more than happy uh, to, uh, to answer them. OK, Jan. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few questions in. Uh, one of the first questions is, what about CJK languages? What does one do with that? Okay, yeah, uh, Korean, Chinese, uh, Japanese. Um, we don't have them yet, but we are working on it. So stay tuned, and we will have them very soon. Okay. How do you bait label audio files? Okay, that's a good question. Yeah, the, uh, what we can do with, uh, you know, typically you bait label uh, by the page. So uh, how do you deal with this uh, with audio files? Now, what we see with audio, video, and images is that we actually, uh, in our legal production system, uh, we have placeholders. And these placeholders can be like pages that can be bait stamped, which then refer to an audio recording. Um, so what we can do is that in our uh, native uh, bait labeling wizard, uh, where we can allow different types of combination of metadata, uh, dictionary or file name or sequential number, uh, we can generate these base numbers also for objects that are not paper-based. Um, and, uh, and that works uh, fully acceptable to uh, everybody's uh, requirements. 
I hope that answers the question. Okay. Um, what do you do if the file format uh, is not one you support? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. We, uh, there's a lot of different file formats out there, and um, and especially on the PC platform, uh, the WAV, WAV files are the best. Uh, so you have to try to convert them to that format. Again, don't convert your data too much. Um, yeah, if you are converting, uh, you need to have a defensible documented process. Um, so th this 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 will be challenged in court. Uh, you're you're converting data from one form to the other, so people ask questions about this. Uh, so this is uh, something uh, you have to do. But the best is to record it. We we support many different file formats. Uh, I think we're, we're there's more than 25 different uh, codecs uh, that we support. So most of them uh, we support them. If you do have an exotic one, uh, let us know, and we'll see how we can help you. Okay. How long does it take to index 10,000 voicemails? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Depends uh, who's uh, who's leaving them. <laughs> uh, some people can leave a voicemail of uh, ten minutes. Other people just five seconds. Um, but in general, uh, uh, what we see is that uh, depending on the hardware, um, hundred ten thousand voicemails it will typically day you know one day maybe two days, and then you can search them. Uh, now ten thousand voicemails is a lot. If you need to transcribe them, you'll be working on it uh, a long, long time. Um, so, uh, so it's uh, you know, one or two days, and then everything's searchable. Uh, so much less than uh, transcribing. Okay, um, I'm going to give it uh, 30 seconds to see if we have any more questions coming in. Yeah, and if people don't have questions for now, you, know, you can always uh, send them to us. We would love to show this uh, technology and demo it. Or if you have some recordings from your own organization, uh, you, know, you can always send them to us. Uh, we can make them searchable. Nothing works better than searching on your own data, uh, uh, especially if you want to impress your colleagues uh, and, uh, and show them what they can find. It's, and then they can also get a feeling for the quality of the technology and how to tune the thresholds, precision recall, and everything we discussed today. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Jan, for an excellent presentation. I'm sure our attendees uh, appreciated it. And uh, we're going to wrap it up for now. Um, have a great day, everybody, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye-bye.